All right, recording is started. We can't see you, George, but as soon as we can, you I can, can spot you. No, there's no you image. Just your, just your name. You can, well, I'm trying to, to open, but it says you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Hmm. I definitely did not stop that, George. <laughs> Something <laughs> is not right there. Was it you, Raimundo, that stopped me? <laughs> uh, I'm pushing a few buttons. I'm not having any luck letting you start again. Uh, let me make you a co-host, see if that helps. All right, try it now, George, if you can. No. As we see, okay. Hey, here now I, you're there. All right, we're going to spotlight you. Here we go. Uh, here I am. Here I am. Okay. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. You all welcome to the Teacher Education Summit, uh, an empowering day of a professional growth and development, a joint organization by the United States Brazil Exchange Alumni Piauí, USBAPI. And Michigan State University, this wonderful university. This summit is set to illuminate the path forward for English language teachers and all dedicated professionals who shape the minds of tomorrow. The 2023 summit theme asks us to explore the idea of language teaching at a crossroad. With so many recent changes and worldwide events, we hope to spend the day asking ourselves how we can use the tools, resources, and materials to innovate our teaching practice. We will we, we also explore the many changes we've seen in the last few years as we all navigated our way through interruptions and continuity of instruction. We will explore the innovations, practices, and worldviews we know we now have in our teacher's toolkit. We encourage you to actively participate in our upcoming sessions and take advantage of the resources we offer. Your expertise and experiences will undoubtedly, undoubtedly enrich our community, fostering an environment of growth and collaboration. We hope that this summit we, will bring us together to share our perspectives, reflect on our experiences, and embrace innovative language teaching and learning methodology. Before introducing our speakers, our lecturers for today, I would like to uh, welcome and congratulate the authorities here present from the Secretariat of Education of the State of Piauí and also from the Secretariat of the City of Teresina, the capital of the State of Piauí. Today, we have the privilege of hosting uh, esteemed educators and authorities who have dedicated their lives to the pursuit of knowledge and the betterment of our educational system. In our virtual room today, we are honored to have the presence of Dustin De Felice. Dustin De Felice uh, is an experienced educator uh, coming up to his second decade of the, uh, on the job. Dustin has a passion for working with teachers, learners, and organizations in creating an environment of success. As a scholar, he has explored language teaching and learning through qualitative inquiries, and he is particularly interested in technology and is related to the development of materials and its use in traditional and virtual classroom. His teaching has taken him around the U.S. and Mexico. And he has regularly advocates for language learning at Michigan State University and beyond. Of course, he is honored to continue the legacy of the past director, Susan Gass, ELC management, faculty, and staff. He looks forward to helping grow the ELC, serve Michigan students and scholars, and work toward a dynamic and sustainable future. Dustin holds in a PhD in second language acquisition and instructional technology from the University of South Florida and an MA in linguistics with a, con a concentration in TESL from North Northwestern Illinois University and a BA in speech communication with a minor in Spanish 
and linguistics from the Northeastern Illinois University. Uh, he is a visionary leader who has consistently demonstrated a commitment to enhancing education and fostering innovation in our education institutions. Distinguished professor from Michigan University, MSU, Dr. Bruna Summer Farias came to the US, went to the US from Brazil, to more specifically from the state of Rio Grande do Sul, uh, to pursue her doctorate in the interdisciplinary second language acquisition and teaching program at the University of Arizona. While there, she contributed considerably to the program in Portuguese as a foreign language through designing courses, teacher training, and program evaluation. Her dissertation focused on the ways that journal-based writing instruction is an additional language, can also benefit writers in their first language. She has conducted research funded by CERCLL and other entities, and she has presented and published uh, on these topics with articles appearing in journals such as Written Communication, the International Journal of Learner Corpus Research, and the Journal of the National Council of Less Commonly Taught Language, NCO LTCL, a Fulbright alumna who graduated summa cum laude from the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul, FERC, uh, UFIX, in Brazil. She has proficiency in Spanish and French, as well as her native Portuguese. She teaches FLT courses, such as methods, L2 literacy, language concepts, and culture in foreign language teaching. She is involved in additional projects, such as in, vid in the video-based inquiry, professional development project called VIVID, Vivid, and funded by the National LCTL Resources Center the large learning corpus collection project called MCACAWS, a repository of resources for teaching literature and literacy in additional language known as FLITE and the American Association of Teachers of Portuguese, AOTP. Uh, these, accomplishment, these accomplished individuals have dedicated Bruna and Dustin, their careers to significantly to the advancement of research and learning within our academic institutions. Their dedication to the scholarship and mentorship has left an indelible mark on countless students. We are deeply grateful to have this esteemed individual among us today. Their presence signifies their commitment to collaborative efforts aimed at improving the educational landscape fostering innovation and empowering the next generation of learners. As we embark on this individual journey together, let us remember that the exchange of ideas, knowledge and expertise in this room holds the potential to ignite positive transformations in education. We encourage everyone to actively participate, engage in constructive dialogues and contribute to their valuable, with your invaluable insights to our shared mission of enriching the world of learning. Once again, a warm welcome to all of you, and thank you for gracing us with your presence. Uh, so without further ado, let us welcome Dr. Bruna to the virtual stage, followed by Dr. Dustin, as they share their profound insights with us. After their presentations, we all engage in stimulate, stimulating dialogue during the question and answer session. Dr. Brunner, Dr. Brunner, the virtual stage is yours. Please go ahead with your presentation. Thank you so much, George, for this, uh, such a warm welcome. Uh, are you guys able to see my screen? Can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Well, thank you again for the opportunity to be joining you today. I'm deeply um, 
I'm really, really excited to see so many people from all over the world. And what I wanted to bring to the fore today for us to discuss, the title is Constantly Innovating on Teaching. And we are going to hear so many great ideas about technology and how to access and incorporate those tools into our classrooms so that we are contributing to innovation today. But uh, one of the first questions that I want to ask us today is what is innovation and what are the skills of an innovative teacher? I think all of us, when you think of innovation or something new nowadays, we think of technology, right? That's one of the first things that come to our mind. And I want us to take a step back, actually, to not think uh, only on technology, but let's think of how can we integrate technology into our classrooms in an intentional and purposeful way. So when we think of tech tools, many different types of platforms may come to our minds, maybe Padlet. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but this is an example of how I use Padlet. It's a map and my students pin where they are from or where they've been to introduce, introduce themselves and talk more about their background. This is one way you may think of Quizlet. This is an app that uh, let us create flashcards. So they study different concepts in our classroom. Uh, there's also FigJam, a new option of a whiteboard similar to Jamboard that lets students collaborate at the same time in the same screen. Or you may think of Poll Everywhere, which is a live poll where students can contribute to their answers and you see the results on the screen right away. So there are so many different tools, but what I want us to really think about today is that innovating is not simply about incorporating these tools into the classroom, but how we do that in alignment with the student learning outcomes. So as you think of um, all the ideas that we are going to learn today throughout the day about technology, I want us to keep thinking, how does this tool help me uh, make sure that my students are reaching the student learning outcomes or how they are developing language? And this question for me has to do with the fact that society is changing, our students are changing, and learning takes place, takes place inside the classroom, but they learn so much outside of the class too. So how can we make sure that we are connecting what they bring from home to what we want them to expand in our classes? So some of the questions that are always in my mind are, how can we keep up with the changes that they see outside, but still ensure that they are learning to become better language users when we teach languages, but also use that languages to be better citizens. And then how can we create those opportunities in our classes so that they can learn how to navigate these changes in society in a critical way, but in a way that they navigate it, but also contribute to it meaningfully. And technology has a very important role to play because we have access uh, to uh, different communities when we are using technology, when they use social media for example, but we want them to use technology in a purposeful way, as I said, to support uh, language development. And I came up with this four elements for us to quickly take a look today as a way uh, to implement innovation in the classroom. So this is kind of the underlying uh, list of concepts. Uh, so before we think of the tech tools, we think of how we want innovation uh, to take place. And this is basically because the way I see innovation is that innovation is very context-based. We have today, you guys, teachers from all over the world, and context looks very different in each one of your countries. And even inside Brazil, where I'm from, when I look at schools in my own city in the South, districts uh, may look very different. So we need to make sure that we are actively listening to our students to get to know them better. I need to know how they are using language in outside of the classroom to make sure that I am able to connect the way they, they are going to use language inside the class uh, for uh, their purposes of learning a different language or an additional language better. So some of the important questions to ask are, who are my students? What do they like to read, write, listen to, and watch? Many times they are already connected with English in many different ways, and we don't really know it. So intentionally asking them, do they play games in English or in additional language? What movies do they watch? Uh, are they in social media? Do they use mobile apps somehow? So those words in a foreign language pop at our faces. So how can we bring that to the fore to make sure that they uh, are aware that they are already somehow using that language? So 
one way of intentionally using tools for active listening is using a survey, for example, actually asking them, how do you actually use uh, the foreign language in your, in your life? Is it really foreign? That's the idea. So you can use a paper survey to ask them what are the actual uh, uses of language in their lives, or you can use Google Forms, you can use Flip, where they record themselves talking about their practices in the language, even if it's not in the target language. The purpose here is intentionally getting to know how they use that language nowadays before they come into the classroom. Uh, you may choose to use mind maps, even if it's not tech enhanced, they may draw a mind map and show you, oh, this is when I see uh, English, for example, in my life. Um, but the idea here is that you not only collect that as a starting point to teach more meaningfully, but also that you systematize that somehow to go back to that information at the end of the, the unit, the project, the year, so that you show them, this is where you were, this is where you're now. You were playing these games before, now you're able to expand the knowledge and participate in more communities. So you can do that using, uh, for example, Mentimeter during class so that they see each other's interests at the same time, but you can also systematize that in a Padlet. So it's there systematically recorded for you to go back to at the end of class. So it's a way to set goals, you know? So the second element that I want us to look at and think about is what are the outcomes of your language classroom? So we want them to use the language, great. We want them to use the to be, but what is the critical uh, piece of it? So again, I'm going to uh, say it again and emphasize that we want them to learn the language to participate in communities of practice. And by looking at the, the activities they already do, somehow in the foreign language can help us uh, create more meaning learning outcomes inside the classroom to make it less foreign for them. Maybe you don't have much autonomy to craft your curriculum because there is standardized testing that is dictating your outcomes, but looking at how they can use it in their home country, not only when they go abroad, because many times our students don't have that opportunity, but if we show them how they can use it as, as speakers in online spaces, for example, that's uh, an important uh, motivation for them. Uh, and this is one aspect that for me is connected to digital literacies because we want to draw from what they already know to expand their world knowledge and then enlarge that notion of use to show them that they can use it even if they are home. And uh, another very important piece is the critical understanding of these potential known places. They have to ask not only how to do it, how to use the language, but also why. Why do I want to use the language this way? And I want to show you one example. Many times we use, for example, texts and comic strips in our uh, classes. And maybe you think, oh, this is not something that is going to be motivating for them. But if we are expanding to show them how technology can uh, change the way that we make meaning across time, they may feel more relatable to what's going on. So maybe they are on social media and they see those uh, comic strips right now uh, being posted uh, differently, not only more on newspapers, but also uh, on social media. That can be a way for them to feel it's more fine. connected. It's fine. It's to... fine. No big deal. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I yeah, hear something. Well, I'll keep going. And for the sake of time, I'm going to address authorship and interdisciplinarity at the same time. So when we plan our language classes and choose the tools that are going to help us achieve those learning goals, we want to make sure that our lessons are based, uh, are planned around themes so that we can more easily connect how the language is going to help them do something real in the world. And in terms of authorship, we want them to produce something that is going to be shared uh, with more people, not only with us as teachers. Uh, and this is the first point. And the second point is that the language that the students use to produce those texts and products, it has to be leveraged by us. So if we always bring examples from native speakers, they may feel uh, not really identified with what's going on because it may be too hard. So my point here is that we should try to move away from the native speaker paradigm to ease the resistance to a foreign language when they think, oh, I'll never reach that level, but what do we want to actually reach? So we want to use technology to also give access to users, users of language that are uh, speaking a variety of types of language. It's not only the one that we consider L1 speaker, because this is important to their identity construction as well. 
So one example is this project where students had a very big resistance to learning English as a foreign language in Brazil. And they, uh, the, the teachers found out they really like Marvel and movies. So all this unit is based around Marvel. So they are learning English and they created their own memes to talk about uh, uh, different ways of feeling that was related to this project in the Marvel movie. So you can see that even though uh, they created the memes uh, using the computer, they shared it as uh, important, uh, important ways to leverage their production at school. So this is at school for all other students to see and feel like, okay, I can write in English, other people can understand and, and really um, give value to what I'm producing here. So it's a community of practice inside the school. And this is very valuable. So there are different ways of looking at tools that can help us achieve that. And finally, in terms of leveraging learner language, one tool that I want to suggest to you guys is looking at Learner Corpora. It's the, uh, the plural for corpus, which is a large collection of searchable texts produced by learners. So many times we are, again, trying to find texts that are examples for our students to use, but we can also uh, use their own texts to look at how language is uh, uh, making meaning. So there are some tools such as voyantools.org that you can upload your students' text in there and create word clouds. And you can look at patterns and to see what is the more frequent uh, uh, term that they are producing, depending on the topic, just so that you study the language more contextualized. You look at what your students are able to do and have them as a, as a starting point. This is one way to leverage their, learn, uh, their learning process. Another way is looking at available corpora. So if you don't want to uh, uh, use your student's text directly, instead of going to um, uh, other types of resources, you can find corpora that already have lots of learner texts uh, available to you. This is one example, the Crow Corpus. And if you have questions about it, I can share uh, it in the chat later in the Q&A. But you can see patterns of what learners are producing. And that language can be closer and more relatable to what they are able to produce, even in terms of topics, not only proficiency. So this is also uh, an important tool to leverage uh, their own language. And finally, to conclude, because I know I don't have much time and I don't know how much time I have left, but I want to make sure Dustin has time to speak as well. So when we think about ourselves, am I an innovative teacher? Uh, so let's... Uh, think that all of us need support to innovate. Sometimes it is hard. The school doesn't have that many resources or I don't have enough time to learn how a new tool can be incorporated. It's just a lot sometimes. So creating these opportunities to find other teachers online, I think it's really important. Uh, and then if we have that active listening attitude so that we share a little bit more about our context, we can get that inspiration and collaboration going, which translates into more support to even notice what are the potential opportunities for innovation in our own context. And finally, I think seeing our own learners as potential uh, people who can innovate a lot is also important. So every time that we are teaching uh, the language, let's remember to ask why they are doing this. Even when they use translators, they can use translators sometimes, yes, but they have to do it critically and knowing why they use that tool for what purpose and explain to us what would be the differences between languages they produced and how they interpret the output of that tool as well. That's why I have this inspire here. We start with the use, we reflect about the use and ask them to use it again, uh, drawing from what they uh, really uh, reflect on about either text that they read or that they produced in class. And then finally, I really think it's important that we share and for teachers in Brazil, I know not everyone here is from Brazil, of course, but there are important uh, venues out there to share. And this is one example. This is written in English, uh, the, the article. So even if you are not from Brazil, you can see that uh, some journals ask you to share best stories about best practices, lesson plans, proposals of projects. When you think that you don't have many ideas, you can try to find online uh, uh, some inspiration in other teachers' uh, uh, reports of best practices. And I'm inviting you all to also contribute your own. So we keep this strong community of teachers who want to innovate. And um, that's it that I had for today. 
I am very excited to keep talking about it if you want uh, to have questions later. Uh, this is where you can find me on LinkedIn, Twitter, and um, we'll keep talking throughout the day. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much. George, you want to switch it over? I'll just take over. Oh, you can take, you just take over. Oh, just let know that uh, it, it, it will be till noon. So uh, like five minutes before noon, we are going to have the questions and answers. Or if you feel that they have more questions, you can allow more time to them, Dustin, to ask questions about what Bruno said and what you are going to say. Fantastic. Now I'll try to keep us on track. I'll um, I'll be uh, brief, succinct. What's another synonym? I'm running out of synonyms on a Saturday. All right, let me spotlight this. I'm going to share my screen. And here we go. Maybe not. Hold on a second. All right, now we're in business. Except it's not showing. Here we go. Let's go from the beginning. All right. Um, I really appreciate um, Dr. Uh, Summer Farias's words. Um, I almost cried a bit, actually, because she'd mentioned instructional objectives. And um, that's key. That's so key to so many things we do as educators that I was really happy to see that in there. We work, both of us work with teacher educators quite a bit. And many of them just say their objective is to finish the hour, finish the lesson. And that's not really what we want to hear as uh, teacher educators. So uh, thank you for that focus. So I'm Dustin DeFelice. I'm uh, here in the English Language Center in East Lansing, Michigan. And I wanted to give you a couple of things on technology, innovation, and teaching. So i got three things. Like I said, I'll keep this brief so we can have time for questions at the end. And I'm going to start with my first one. This is just looking at examining things that are right in front of us. Many times we don't realize how many tools we have at our, our disposal. Now, of course, it's gonna be different in each context, which is why I think it's the best way for you as an educator and for your student population to sit back and go, hmm, what can we do? What do we have before us? I'm a phenomenologist by trade, which is a qualitative tradition. And this focuses really heavily on finding things that are in right before your eyes. So I'm gonna show you a couple of logos. These are mostly uh, US companies. Many of you may be familiar with a handful of them, but if you take a look, each one of them, there's some kind of message or meaning hidden within those logos. So I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I'll just give you one example, because this is the one that caught me um, by surprise year, many years ago, and that's the FedEx logo. So if you look closely at it, between the E and the X, there's actually an arrow in the way they designed the logo. That's part of their mission, that they're always moving forward, which makes sense for a shipping corporation and a company. But the, for me, the surprise was I had seen that logo a thousand times on trucks, advertisements every day and packages, and I had never noticed it until it, it was brought to my attention. So I think technology, new apps, the latest innovations, these all follow the same pattern. There are so many things out there, in fact, that we don't even realize it because again, we're overwhelmed, we don't have a lot of time, and there's a lot of us, a lot of things for us to consider. So one example from my own daily life is we have a Microsoft product available to us as professors at Michigan State. And it turns out we have apps available as part of that license. And there are the usual typical ones I think many of you are familiar with, Word, Excel, PowerPoint. But then the list gets longer. And you can even click on a button to say, let me see more, more things. Well, it turns out we have 40 some apps available to us that I'll be honest with you, I use maybe five to 10 of these uh, during a, a course of a, uh, a week. And it's in incredible to me the how many things we do have at our disposal in many cases, whether it's on our phone, the app store, um, uh, within our just districts, within our schools, what our, our students have in front of them. It's really a, an amazing piece to consider. So how do you go about doing this then? Well, with my students, I often have them do what's called a personal practical knowledge survey. I ask them to pick a block of time during their day, 
and then just go through what is it they're using that during that block of time? What apps are they using? What devices? What technology? What other pieces are they using during their day? And you might be surprised to see that you do rely on certain things fairly frequently, but you may also be able to see with that reflective practice, hey, I actually do have access to other things that I could try and use. So along those lines, here's one of the biggest problems. We're all busy. We all have lots of students. There's lots of grading. There's lots of administrators around us. How do we get through these things with all of this innovation happening? So I have a couple of guidelines for you. Just going to give you five of them. And I'll be honest with you. I, I like shiny things too. I like new technology, but I, I get it. Sometimes some of these apps that are out there that are super popular really have no learning basis at all. There's no instructional objective that fits with them. So honestly, even if it's what everyone's talking about, maybe just avoid it. And you can use your learning or your excuse as, look, it doesn't promote learning. Why would I use this tool? We have an acronym in English called KISS. It's uh, a little bit uh, rude. Uh, it's keep it simple, stupid, but this applies here. We should really keep our use of technology to simple, streamlined, and small. Many times I, I observe um, instructors, educators who put so many pieces together that wind up breaking because technology is really complicated. For me, if you're not gonna use it more than once, don't bother. Your students don't need to waste their time learning some new app, some new function, if you're not gonna use it more than once. And on the same side, you don't need to spend your weekends, your nights, your, your weeks, putting your time into something that you're gonna use one time. It's just not worth it. For us, we've been paying a lot of attention here at MSU on accessibility. So making sure all of our learners can see and understand and learn from the tools we use. And that's been a high bar to meet, but I think it's worth taking some time to think about, can my students use this tool? And that same goes for user friendliness. Then I think you have to plan for failure. With technology, we know it always doesn't work the same way. Sometimes there are challenges with it. So you know what, don't worry about it. Think back to your instructional objectives, then go back and figure out how to do it without that technology. As long as you have that focus in front of you, you should be okay. So what's the future gonna look like for us? Well, you know, it's crazy. We actually have a future innovation in front of us that's really taken over, taken storm um, in the last few months, the last year or so, and that's um, ChatGPT. And there's other variations of this um, artificial intelligence. There's many out there. Um, I'm imagining many of you have already tried this. Maybe your students are already using it to answer every question you ask them. The thing is, it's here, it, it's, it's in front of us, and we got to figure it out. And in, yeah, Andre, it is amazing. I agree. So I asked, I went to ChatGPT, and I asked them, hey, what is innovative language teaching today? And you can imagine what I would have thought it said, but it's not what it said. So it, it actually gave me this list of things. There was more than eight. There was about 25 things it talked about. And if you look through that list, I think many of us are doing these same things in our classroom already. So what ChatGPT is telling us based on the, the algorithm it's using is these things that we do as teachers in practice. Are there some we might not do as much? Sure. Could we learn a few more and then maybe we'll be innovative? I suppose. But something just didn't seem right about the list. So if you haven't used ChatGPT, you can regenerate a response if you don't like the answer ChatGPT gives you the first time. So I did that. And guess what? I got a few new ideas. Some seem a little more recent and a little more relevant. That includes things like data-driven instruction, the idea of inclusive education. The fact that that's considered innovative is worrisome in many levels. I'm glad to see it's there, but it should not be innovative. It should be our base practice. The one that really caught my eye, though, was professional development for teachers. So even AI itself, ChatGPT, is finding information saying, guess what? You know what's innovative? Giving our time and energy to our teachers and our educators so they're able to do their jobs better. Really amazing to me. Now, there were two that appeared on the actually both times I did this, and that was virtual reality and augmented reality. Look, these things have been around for at least 20 years, and I have to tell you, they're always a, a hot ticket. They're always talked about, but I, I really, I see no meaningful way to incorporate them into most classrooms across the world, let alone um, with our students. So 
I, you know what? Just ignore virtual reality, honestly. And I just don't think it's going to be something in, for another 20, 30, 40 years, really. The one thing that I thought was really funny about ChatGPT's answer is the one thing it didn't include, and that was itself. It never mentioned it's innovative in language teaching. And I don't know if it's because I put the word language in there and I didn't use teaching. So when I did a little bit more of searching using ChatGPT, they did bring up these two pieces, artificial intelligence tutors and the natural language processing. And we're seeing both of these in quite a more frequency than we used to. And they are appearing in all kinds of places from with inside of apps to your phone, your autocorrect, all those things are AI. And those are having an impact on our students, on us. And it really is important for, for going forward. We're gonna see these things more and more. So with that, let me thank you for uh, listening to me today. Please have a great rest of your time at the uh, Teacher Education Summit. I'm gonna put a direct link to that Google Drive, which has my PowerPoint, all of the information I um, presented today, as well as a couple of different things related to um, ChatGPT and AI and how to use it in the classroom. So let me stop my screen share and we'll let it open up for questions. Thank you. All right, so we've got an ability to either have you ask your question, you could put it in the Q&A, or you could put it in the chat. Or if you have anything for us, Alex or George, please let us know. Oh, Dustin, tell me, uh, you, you talked about uh, the a AI. Uh, you, you talked about the advantages of it. And what are the disadvantages? What are the dangers involved in what, what we should be aware in order not to have a, a, a big problems to our society, people like they are hooked in the in the process. For example, nowadays social medias that were something mm -hmm. innovative, that's something incredible. But in some way, they are grasping too much attention from people. People are not socializing. They go to bars, to restaurants, and they don't have fun together. They don't keep talking, looking at the other people's eyes, but they keep their eyes on the on the cell phones navigating uh, social medias. What are the problems involved? You talked about the advantage of AI. What are the disadvantages? What we have to be careful? Are there any studies? Have you have, have you seen something like that? Uh, definitely. And so the three that come to mind, these are the three big ones, in my opinion. The first one is ChatGPT pulls from all kinds of sources and provides no citations to where it got the information from. So in a sense, if it's pulling from a dirty swamp, then every information it gives you is going to be dirty as well. Students, oftentimes, educators ourselves, don't have critical thinking in some cases to say, wait a minute, that information may not be correct. That actually might be completely false and dangerous. They are working on some safeguards for that. But as we know, the internet is the internet. It's wide open. So we're going to have to worry about that problem. The basic tool is out there. You'll, you'll notice on many of these AI tools, you have to pay premium to do different things, more advanced options. And that's that's a problem for many, many users. So that means some people are getting information that's better than others, only because they have the ability to pay more money in there. I think my biggest worry with AI, though, is that ability that the fact that it just outright lies. So you can ask it something and it can pull in information. So for example, you can say, make a bio up about yourself. And it'll pull things in that look real, but you know yourself, you never did that conference, you never attended this talk, you didn't invent that piece of material, whatever it is. And that's scary because again, some people can take that information at face value and that's, that's very scary. So our college is looking at three, two or three things basically. They're trying to say, look, it's there. So we need to find a policy for when to use it, not to ban it, but when do we use it? Then disclose, what you did with it so we can talk about it as educators and students and then finally find the pathway for the information where it came from it's a tall order but i think if we do those things we can use it in a good way and not necessarily in a bad way thank you Dustin. sorry bruna I just wanted to add a quick follow up to this, and I think it's somehow related to that idea I was trying to put forward with uh, 
learning outcomes. So do we want our students to learn how to use these tools critically? I think that can be part of the goals of our classes too. Just like they have to learn how to use a dictionary. It's there for them to use. It's a an important resource, but they have to look critically at that resource. And I think with AI, similarly, instead of banning, we have to help them to understand why they should or should not on, or when to use it. So as we learn ourselves, I think we can teach them how to do that too. Oh, thank you, Bruna. Uh, Bruna and Dusty, we have questions here from our Q&I uh, session. So one, one question comes from Andrea Ronconi. Uh, do you think real-time translation with AI can put an end on language teaching? Dustin, Bruna? Uh, so this question comes up all the time. We heard the same round of worry and concern for Google Translate. And I'll be honest with you, not to tell my age, but in the 90s, I was told by my teachers when we had electronic dictionaries that were tiny little things, they were going to lose their job because why would you need a teacher anymore without that dictionary? And it's just not true. We are, we're going to be needed more than ever because of that critical thinking piece that Bruna mentioned. We have to have our students who are able to be critical thinkers, not only in their, their home language, but in multiple languages. So I think if we can get beyond the drill and kill model of education and we can move into really transformative methods, we can be a part of it. We don't have to worry about losing our job because of AI. Okay, we have here now a question from Ibas Khan. Don't you think that tools like a chat GT, GT, GPT, sorry, are a, a big hydrants, a big, a uh, big obstacle in the way of originality in writing? Bruna? Sure, I can take this one. And I think it has to do with, again, the learning outcomes. Are we teaching a second language, a foreign language, because we want them to reproduce the grammar? I want them to know the pattern only? Or am I really interested in their ideas? So I think it's... Um, a challenge for us as teachers to really come up with meaningful projects. I really want to get to know you as a person. So it's not only about you knowing how to use the language, but I want to know your ideas. So creating tasks that are follow up to the writing, not only give me this piece of writing, I want to know what you think about this topic, but you keep asking why or how would you change it? For what reason? So something that is contextualized, um, for example, asking them to write about their own context, about their city, about their school, about their friends. I think it's a way to encourage them to use it to maybe give the first ideas as a draft, but to develop that they need their own minds. So AI can be a tool for drafting and maybe giving feedback and uh spotting the errors, any mistakes, but again, it's it's not going to, teaching them how to use it, it's not going to make originality go away, but it's going to, uh, uh, how can I say, demand us more from us as teachers and demand more from them as students. So, so instead of uh, giving us more free time as, as educators, we have to be, we have to work harder in a way to know how to demand uh, work from our students, uh, thinking from our students. Does in the same question. Well, like, like many things in life, I cannot top Bruna's answer. She's she's an amazing educator, so <laughs> perfect. Okay, <laughs> let me get a question now from Fida. Should Chat G GPT be recommended to students for assignments or exam preparation, preps? Uh, kids that are 15 or 16 year old. Bruna, Dustin. So I did share a link from our college talking about the idea of writing. So we have a department of writing, rhetoric and culture. And their suggestion would be that, yes, you should recommend it for your students, but not on their own. Let them work with you, show them the results they bring you, then work through the language they give you with them so they can improve on their practice. So the tool, in my opinion, is an amazing tool for ideation. So the ability to look for ideas, to pull, to brainstorm, it's really amazing. So if you're stuck on something, uh, you know, you want a business plan, you want to open a new store, you can ask it that question and it can give you all kinds of ideas. 
The challenge is, what do you do with that information? I think that's where we fit ourselves in as educators, and especially as language educators. So we give them that tool. You know they're going to use it anyway, even if we don't recommend it. And if we ban it, they're going to use it more. So we might as well incorporate it in the same way that, look, when I was a kid, I had a teacher that said an eraser was cheating because an eraser on a pencil, right? Because you can change your answer. I thought that was the craziest thing I ever heard. I still think it's crazy, but it's the same idea. Sometimes innovations are taken as cheating, but if we use them in the right way, we can go really far. Thank you. The same question, Bruna. Yeah, I agree with Dan. I think we just have to reframe the way we look at it, but again, being very intentional about how we ask our students to use it, asking them to use it, but think critically about it. And uh, I see other questions about how can we use it to plan classes uh, in the chat. So similarly, they can give us a great uh, way to start an idea. Sometimes we get that anxiety of the blank page, so it can help us break that. But uh, then we have to bring our own ideas to it. And the same thing uh, uh, with the 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 students when they use it. I also shared a link just to, to, to share that. I shared a link uh, of an article in the chat with some other ideas if you want to keep reading further. There are lots of resources coming out nowadays with ideas of how to plan the classes. Uh, but um, yeah, I think being very intentional. But it's very normal. I think that we are all anxious about it because it's been changing so rapidly and we don't know how to incorporate that. So I think it's going to be important that we, again, uh, come together to support each other as innovators also about ChatGPT. That's why I'm uh, sharing these resources so we learn from uh, the teachers who have already tested um, the, the, the tools in their, in their context. Oh, as we are running out of time, thank you all of the viewers uh, for the nice questions you have asked. We have many good questions in here, but unfortunately, we are running out of time. I would like to say thank you, uh, Bruna. Thank you, Dustin, for your participation in this event. Uh, Bruna, would you like to say something uh, as before we move to our next panel, to our first panel? Yeah, I just want to thank everyone for being here. It's really motivating for us as teacher educators to see how many of you, of you are interested in learning more about innovation and sharing with each other. So I'm just looking forward to hearing from everyone throughout the day and really seeing how if you want to share the ideas that you are implementing in your classes. So there are many uh, spaces out there for online communities. So I just hope to keep hearing from you and learning from you as well. Thank you. Dustin? Sorry, I was answering some of those questions in the chat uh, and the okay, uh, box. Okay. Um, yeah, no, I really appreciate all you being here today. Thanks for coming from all over the world. We enjoyed meeting everyone. Um, George and I, at some point, will play baseball or, or go to a baseball game sometime in the future. Oh, so thank you. I didn't forget the project. The, I'm, re I'm writing down the project, and we're going to make baseball a popular number one sport in Brazil, too. Fantastic. I'll be there supporting you. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Bruno. Thank you very much. Dustin, now we're going to our first panel of the day that will be hosted by Luzia. I say thank you very much for your presence here, you all. Bye-bye. Hello, everyone. Okay, that's panel discussion one. Okay, we are going to talk about teaching methods for 21st century. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, okay, uh, we are now ready to embark on an enlightening and engaging panel discussion for panel one. And it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our three esteemed panelists each one bringing in a wealth of knowledge and experience to the virtual stage. First, I'd like to introduce Amy, Amy Kroos. Professor Amy is an academic specialist 
for the departments of philosophy, global studies, and the English language center. Holds a BA in English from Northwestern College in Iowa and a master's in TESOL from Michigan State University. He has 25 years of teaching experience with seven of those years teaching English in South Korea. She has been with the English Language Center since 2007. Okay, and following Amy, we are honored to have Professor Afroza Tina join our panel. Professor Afroza serves at Defodil International University, Bangladesh, as a senior lecturer in the Department of English. Currently, she is teaching at a government school and college in Tashkent, Uzbekistan. She is a certified advanced TESOL practitioner and an e-teacher alumna of the U.S. Department of State, Dhaka, Bangladesh. She has been nominated as one of the best performing faculty members of DFOD International University for the year 2020. And in 2016, 2017, she was awarded with a scholarship to teach at Bullet Review University at Zongyudak, Turkey, under the Mevlana Exchange Faculty Program. She's a member of several national and international bodies, which includes both academic and voluntary institutions. She has presented in several national and international conferences, which includes China, Egypt, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, Nepal, and India. With the academic publications and presentations in different national and international conferences, she has earned inspiration to continue with her research interest which includes assessment, learning, autonomy, ELT, social linguistics, and mobile learning. And last, but certainly not least, you are fortunate to have Leah Edis, Edis right, with you as today. Leah is, 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 has been teaching in Michigan State University English Language Center for 15 years. She holds back BA, degrees in Spanish and Anthropology from Iowa State University and MA in TSOL from Middlebury Institute of International Studies. At Michigan State University, she, te she teaches courses at all levels in the Intensive English and English for Academic Purpose programs. She coordinates the grammar and content-based courses at the center. She also teaches in special training programs for visiting FML teachers, including PGPI. Okay, so as we proceed, let me outline the format of this panel discussion. Each panelist will have um, precisely 12 minutes to present their insights and perspectives. Following these presentations, we will make a transition to either a dynamic and um, interact, interactive facilitated by questions from the chat. Uh, yeah, you, our esteemed audience can contribute, yes, to this conversation by submitting your questions uh, through the chat feature. So without further ado, let's commence our panel discussion with Leah. We will kick off our conversation. Afterward, we will hear from Professor Afroza and then Amy, okay? And following their presentations, we dive into a lively dialogue fulfilled by your questions, okay? Leah, the virtual stage is now yours. Please proceed with your presentation. Thank you. Let me just get my slides up. Okay. All right, can you see my screen? That's good. Sure can. Okay. So hello, everybody. I'm so happy to be here with you today. Let me move my Zoom screen. Um, today, I want to talk about how we conceive of model English speakers in our classroom. So I'd like to begin by sharing just a little bit more about my teaching con 
con, uh, context. So as she said, I do teach in the MSU English Language Center's intensive English and academic English programs, and I am the coordinator for our content and grammar classes in those programs. I also do some EFL teacher training, and I'm always happy to work with the PDPI teachers. Um, and then recently, I've also been teaching since 2020 integrated arts and humanities courses for our general MSU undergraduate population. And that humanities course is asynchronous and online with 50 plus students per section. And I know that my teaching contexts are quite different from many of yours. So for today, I wanted to find a topic that would be relevant to all of us. So in reflecting on the theme, teaching in the 21st century, I thought about what's changed most in my classrooms in the last decade. And I think that's what, what is most salient to me in addition to the technological challenge or technological changes that other people are gonna address in other sections. Um, what's most salient is the increasingly diverse backgrounds and goals of the students in my classes. So in my undergraduate course, I have students who are working full-time, first-generation college students, multilingual students, international students, students with various accommodations for learning differences, students who are attending remotely, not on campus, et cetera. So I've been seeing firsthand that there really isn't a quote unquote, typical US college student. Um, and in our intensive English program, we have seen a reduction in overall student numbers, but an increase in student diversity. So this summer I had a grammar class with students from Taiwan, Belarus, uh, Saudi Arabia, Japan, Rwanda, Senegal, and Korea. And some were just out of high school, Others were looking to do master's or PhD programs. And because of our small size, we had a lot of proficiency levels in the same room from high beginning to advanced. Um, so it was a challenge, but also exciting to have so much diversity. And I found that my students are not just using English in the classroom, right? They're in online gaming communities. They're consuming English content on TikTok. They're using it in the international business world, et cetera. And so they're regularly encountering English that varies from what we typically present in English textbooks and classrooms and teaching materials. And I think this is really great. So how does all of this increasing diversity impact what I'm doing in my English language classroom? It's really been challenging me to look at who I present as model users of English language, whose perspectives are presented in my lessons, whose voices are heard, whose stories are told, whose language use is valued, and importantly, who do my students want to model their English on? So I reflect back with some embarrassment on my early experience as an EFL teacher in Japan, when I was so often asked by my students, you know, what do Americans think about that? How do native speakers say X? And I would answer really confidently, presenting my own experience as typical and representing my own accent, my own English as model native speaker English. And I didn't even really stop to think about how my experience as a white, Midwestern, upper middle class, blonde, young woman might be a specific experience rather than something typical. So now I'm thinking about my language use and my purpose in my classroom quite differently. Um, this summer, I wanted to share this with you. The American Academy of Arts and Sciences published a really interesting special issue on language and social justice in the United States. And it contained 14 papers examining powerful linguistic biases in education, law, politics, and society. And for me, it really reinforced the importance of addressing language bias in the classroom. So I had three main takeaways from this volume for today. Um, first, I think it's important to name what I'm teaching as standardized American English. Second, I wanna make sure that I'm featuring a greater range of people who are effectively using SAE. And third, I wanna make sure that I emphasize the value of other non-standard varieties of English. So I wanna take a look at how to apply each of these and I wanna share some great resources that I've found with you. So um, first, the importance of naming standardized American English. So here are some quotes I found inspiring from Curzan's article here. Um, While standardized American English is often described as neutral or unmarked, it indexes whiteness and higher socioeconomic class. 
And standard language ideology generally works invisibly by nature of a sort of common sense approach to right and wrong or better and worse language patterns. So it allows, if not encourages, the dissemination of misinformation about language variation, which I think in the past that I've been guilty of as well. So for example, something simple um, in grammar class, when I teach grammar, we often look at verb patterns through X words. And if you're interested in that, I've linked some resources about X words at the end of my presentation. But we look at grammar in this way and we see that there are six patterns that are possible verb combinations in standard American English. Modal base, have third, be ing, be third, be nothing, and shy do plus base. And then we can combine those to make other longer forms like modal progressive or perfect passive. But using these six patterns, here's an excerpt from a handout in my class. I tell students that X words can help you edit your writing. So the following are errors, not possible verb patterns in standardized American English. I didn't came to class. We have do plus past form, so that's not possible. We have he was study Japanese, be plus base, so that's not possible. Um, and they can use this pattern to look for mistakes in their writing and to fix things. But I also think it's important to add that other varieties of English may allow other correct patterns. So for example, the sentence she working is not standard, but um, the only using only the ing form is okay in African American vernacular English. Um, and things like I might could finish my paper today, that's not in my dialect, but it is okay. This modal modal base uh, pattern is okay in Southern US English. So just sharing those little things with students. And then um, I link to short little YouTube videos that um, help students explore those with curiosity. So um, that little amount of language awareness and encouraging students to bring in any other examples that they might find, treating those kind of things with a sense of fun and curiosity rather than with judgment and shame, I think is really important. Um, the second thing I'm trying to do is feature a greater range of SAE users in class. So once I've named that standard American English, I want to make sure we've got a lot of different voices. So as Dr. Charity Hudley reminds us in this volume, we have to delve deeper into our notions of who is a good speaker and even who you want to be around and communicate with. And luckily, the Internet makes bringing in more voices much easier than it was 20 years ago when I started teaching. So here's a few examples of websites that you can use. Um, the first is ELO, the English Listening Lesson Library Online. Here you can search for audio or video by English level, grammatical feature, or content topic. So here's a screenshot of one of the pages. Um, this is an example featuring second conditional. And the question is, what would you do if you had a lot of money? And then you have a whole bunch of different speakers speaking uh, informally on the topic. So it's not scripted English, it's um, natural in the moment English. And it features all kinds of speakers from around the world. So this one has a speaker from Guam, a speaker from Brazil, and a speaker from Australia. So you'll hear different varieties of English, different accents. And then there's a grammar exercise and a quiz as well. So it's a nice, uh, good resource for teaching. Um, when I teach public speaking, I like to have my students choose from a set of international TED speakers to shadow or imitate. So um, they'll record themselves reading a portion of the transcript that they choose first. Then they watch the original speaker and make notes on the transcript of um, stress, intonation, speed, pauses, et cetera. And then they record themselves again, making any changes in speaking style that they wish. And then finally, I ask them to reflect on how that activity helped them with fluency. For a more informal speaking and listening practice, I love this StoryCorps website. Here we have thousands of recordings of Americans telling stories to each other, family stories, childhood stories, work stories, love stories, and some have been made into animated shorts. One of my favorites is this one called Eyes on the Stars, which is the story of Ronald McNair, a young boy who grew up in the segregated US South and then became one of our first African-American astronauts. This story is told by his brother and it makes a great part of a lesson in our civil rights history unit. So including all these divorce, diverse voices also relates to my third takeaway, which is emphasizing the value of other varieties of English. Here's a quote from linguist Walt Wolfram describing his experience at many different US institutes of higher education. 
He said, it was commonly assumed that non-standard versions of English were simply a collection of errors or ungrammatical patterns to be stamped out in the process of higher education. And while these universities might have been progressive in their stances on other social issues, language equality was exempted from inclusion. So he reports on how at the University of North Carolina, they are trying to actively promote language pride and language diversity on campus. And this video here uh, features students from different regions, ethnic backgrounds and language backgrounds saying the phrase, I sound like a scholar to underscore the fact that language variation isn't connected with intelligence or scholarly achievement. And I'll put the link so you can watch it in the chat uh, later. But I would love to do something similar with my students um, on our campus building community here. Um, I also wanted to share this. I just found this new reference source I'm really excited about. It's a brand new phonetics and phonology textbook that contains descriptions and speech samples of English varieties way beyond the standard British and American ones. So I'm excited to have this resource that I can consult and share. Now, um, we don't have enough time. I'd love to talk more, but depending on the needs and interests of my students and any biases they express, I do take time in most of my classes to talk about regional and cultural diversity in US English, especially myths around African-American English and the care that non-Black speakers need to take to appreciate and not to misappropriate it. And so if you're interested in those topics, uh, please explore my Padlet, which I'll link in the chat, where I've posted great sources that my students and I and some of you have enjoyed learning from. So I'll share this and I will share the rest of the links that I've mentioned here in the chat. So I think my time is up. So I'm thankful for the opportunity to be here with you today. And I'm looking forward to learning from the rest of our panelists. And I welcome any questions or thoughts you'll have for me during the Q&A time. Yeah, let me try to stop my show. Okay. All right. Thank you, Leah. It was a great presentation. Okay. So now we're gonna we're gonna listen to a frozen, okay, right now. And then we have the questions just later. Okay. So a frozen, welcome to your panel. Thank you. Let me share my screen. So can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, because uh, I'm actually having trouble. At the very beginning, I would like to express my gratitude, of course, towards the organizers for organizing such a wonderful event. This Teacher Education Summit is such an amazing summit, which I look forward to every year. But this time, I'm actually a bit disappointed because I have just shifted to a new place and got a new PC. And uh, yesterday, day before that, I was attending meetings which I couldn't attend that way because I had troubles in terms of listening. I had troubles in terms of sharing my screen. So if my screen is uh, visible and if I am audible today, I think uh, I'm quite okay at this moment. So thank you everyone for joining this session and thank you the organizers for giving me this wonderful opportunity to share some interesting ideas. Uh, which I won't say new, but some interesting ideas, of course, with you all today. Now, the title of the session is very interesting, Teaching Methods for 21st Century, but I would like to ask a question, how to start? How to start? Each and everyone is talking about so many different types of methods, thousands of methods, hundreds of methods, but how to start? from where to start, which should be the primary focus or the prime focus. So that is where, uh, from where actually I should start. And at the very beginning, I would like to request all of you to answer very few questions of mine with just simply A or B. I repeat, 
If your answer is A, you will just simply write A in the chat box. If your answer is B, you will simply write B in the chat box. You don't need to write the full answer at all. Now, my first question, where would you like to enjoy your vacation? Everyone, all the participants, I can see 129 participants, please write your answer. Would you like to enjoy your vacation in a beachside resort or a hillside cottage? Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. A, B, A, B, B, A, and Will. That's great. So it's difficult to actually differentiate whether people would like to go to beachside resorts or hillside cottage. Personally, I would like a hillside cottage. So I'm with beachside people, but Will, that's okay. This was just a question. My next question. Would you like to visit an art museum or a history museum in future? Very quickly, A or B, an art museum or a history museum? Okay, a lot of answers. Thank you so much, everyone, for responding. Personally, my interest is an art museum. Okay, uh, well, thank you so much once again. And the next question, which one would you prefer? Losing your passport or losing your smartphone? Be careful. Be careful, participants. Uh, which one would you prefer, passport or smartphone? Yes, I think. Yes, absolutely correct. I think losing smartphones will be uh, much more convenient than passports because, well, passport is a very serious thing. Wonderful, wonderful responses. And my last question, what would you like to do in your free time? Would you like to read a book or watch a movie? Quickly, A or B. Read a book, watch a movie. A or B. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. It varies, of course, from person to person. Someone would like to read a book in free time. Someone would like to watch a movie. Personally, I'd like to read a book. Uh, well, uh, it differs, obviously, from person to person. But thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much for responding. Now, here I start. There are thousands of methodologies. There are thousands of methodologies which not only I, but I believe everyone can mention for 21st century teachers. A lot of experts have been talking about so many things, starting from flipped classroom to project-based learning, cooperative learning, gamification, problem-based learning, design thinking, competency-based learning. There's also collaborative learning and lots of others. Now, which one should I pick up? Which one should be convenient for my classroom? Which one should I focus on as a teacher? Which one should my students can collaboratively work on in the classroom? Which method would be beneficial for my students? So these are the crucial questions, I believe, at this stage. Now, here I believe that the current practices focus on starting from my own classroom. This is a wonderful quotation, which I got actually from uh, this year's TESOL International Convention, which was in Portland, Oregon, uh, USA. Uh, well, I actually got this interesting uh, quotation from their weather we are experts or not, whether we are very good teachers or not, that don't matter. The thing that matters is whether I'm focusing on my own classroom or not. So here I will focus today. Now, what is a flipped classroom? My focus entirely today will be on only one of the teaching methods or approaches, which is flipped classroom. But why flipped classroom? I will answer the question later. We will discuss this later. But before that, what do we mean by a flipped classroom? I believe uh, most of us know the definition of flipped classroom, but still, once again, just a brief overview of the idea. A flipped classroom inverts the traditional learning experience. Yes, of course, here lectures are shared outside the class time for individual review individual readings as homework. And it, these lectures could be given, could be provided through different ways, through different platforms. 
And here in flipped classroom, the classroom time is reserved for discussion, for activities, for assignments, for completing assignments maybe. So this is what we know generally by a flipped classroom. Now this flip actually is from passive to active. So shifting from passive learning to active learning. Well, the hours at school are made more meaningful in flipped classroom when we see that the content has already been viewed by the students, by the children at home. And then actually it shifts from passive to active learning. Now, when the students or the children viewed the content, they view the content on their own, at their own pace, then in the classroom, they are ready to engage themselves in the discussion, the debate, the discuss, and they come up with new concepts. They, they actually come up with new knowledge. They try to establish new knowledge, new concepts, new ideas. And this actually turns them from passive to active. And that is why today we have been focusing on this approach so much. So, Finally, we can see that this flip classroom approach actually is shifting from lots to hots, from lots to hots. And here we focus on the Bloom's taxonomy. Here the focus is on Bloom's taxonomy pyramid, which is actually uh, moving from lower order thinking skills, I mean lots, to higher order thinking skills, which is hots. So from moving to from lower order thinking skills to higher order thinking skills is what we know as flip classroom. But in the traditional method, what did we do actually? The, we did actually lots in the classroom. Like we do the remembering things. We actually try to make our students understand things in the classroom. And then we try to give them some homework, assignments, and lots of other things. Uh, I mean, the evaluation, the application, the uh, analyzing part, actually they were, uh, they're part of homework earlier. But in the HUDs, actually the students are getting all the knowledge. They're reviewing all the contents on their own, at their own pace and in the classroom, they're applying or analyzing or evaluating uh, through different types of activities, tasks, assignments, and projects. So that is what we mean by shifting from lots to HOTS at school, colleges, or universities. Now, this flipping brings the HOTS to school and the students gain this guidance and facilitation of the teacher and the support of their peers in the classroom. Now, what happens when the students don't read on their own. Now, the very crucial question, which personally, as a teacher, I felt, as a language teacher, I often feel in my classroom that the students are not reading the contents at all. Some students are not reading the contents at all. Some students are not attentive. Some students are not caring about the contents. They don't care about the uh, handouts. They don't, don't care about the videos. They don't care about the uh, interesting games which I uh, provide them through Moodle, through different platforms. So uh, what actually to do with these students? As teachers, I believe, or as a language teacher, I believe that I have that, I have that, uh, you know, scope. I have that freedom to include marks or incentives on the basis of students' performances. So. That doesn't mean that, well, if students are attempting class tests, they are going to get, if, if they pass the test, they are going to get all the marks. Well, uh, giving mark is something very important. It could be something uh, related to the uh, curriculum syllabus, or it is very much associated with the, uh, with the both formative and summative kind of assessment. But uh, giving marks actually is something which could be associated with activities like this, where we should ensure as teachers that students are attentive, students are getting the contents on their own, students are trying, even if they don't get the contents, 
uh, in the entire content, but still they are trying at least to get some of the contents on their own and they are coming in the classes with some of the ideas, then obviously we can give them some intensive uh, incentives obviously work very well. We all know as teachers that they can boost up the energy of the students. So sometimes uh, we actually need to think on this as teachers. And also at the same time, we can uh, request our students to take part, to, to actually focus on the content on their own so that they can take part in the group work or the pair work. Of course, as language teachers, we feel that group work, peer work, these are very, very important, both inside and outside the classroom. And uh, if they are the not front, getting the content, Excuse if me. they are not actually having all the things, then they won't be able to take yeah. part in any of the group work yeah. or peer work. So that is why this is so important. Thank you. Thank you. you have okay, open on. it. Uh, Froza, uh, we have some technical, we have some technical issues. We people see. can't see. People can see. Okay, people so can, can you see, see the screen now? Just a moment. Some people I can, can see. see but some students can, can, but others not. Yeah, it's curious. Some people can see it, but some people can't. I don't know what. I'm not sure what to suggest here. Okay, but uh, it is. Can you stop your screen share and start it again, if you don't mind? I think it's a good um, idea. Okay, yes. Let Thank you. Time. I'm sorry, actually, I'm having this trouble. I think now you can. I'm seeing lots of yeses, so I think we're in good shape. Thank you for letting do that shit, shit for us. So can you see the screen now? Yes, uh, exactly. Okay, thank you. So at this moment, I believe that we need teachers not only need training, they need follow-up actually. They actually need follow-up activities like uh, the schools, the colleges, the universities. These days they are organizing so many trainings. Teachers are so very conscious about you know, attending webinars, seminars. They are taking part in conferences. They are. Uh, they they have become very good listeners these days. More specifically, after the pandemic. Now, do all these trainings work every time? That is a question. Now, for these follow up activities are important. If a group of teachers are trained well, uh, then obviously, uh, time to time or gradually, they also will have to come up with their follow up activities so that they can receive feedback from the experts. Uh, from uh, from their peers sometimes. Uh, they should have some reviews and uh, they need to work on those feedback, suggestions, or reviews. So these are actually very, very important, which I believe that they are often missing even in my context. So we are having a lot of trainings, but we don't have any follow-up activities and that's why we actually tend to lost somewhere at the end. So uh, I think... Uh, if we think of the 21st century skills, if we need to focus on the teaching methodologies of the 21st century, we tend to be very, very cautious about all these things and where peer feedback, student feedback, and review and suggestions from the experts are very, very important. Now, if I request all of you, those who were in this uh, 15 or 20 minutes with me, could you please mention one thing one thing that you would like to share with your colleague uh, after today's session, after you can say both these sessions that uh, you have been enjoying uh, in this uh, keynote sessions or the plenary session that you have been attending, at least one thing that you got from today, not from my session, but at least one thing that, one new thing that you got today, or one thing that you got today, maybe it's not new, but you got today from today's any of these sessions and which you would like to share with your colleague after this summit. Could you please write down at least one thing in the chat box so that we can see whether uh, you got something from uh, the sessions because this education summit is a very, very important summit. Uh, obviously you are getting a lot of insights 
and you are enriching your knowledge. But apart from all these, what is one thing that you would like to share with your colleague after today's, all these sessions? Okay, wonderful, Yashodhara wrote using GPT. Wonderful, Yashodhara, any other ideas from anyone? Mm, the corporate tool, wonderful, Leah. Excellent, uh, lots of Vinicius. Okay, that's great, Vinicius. Thank you. Then, okay, if you would use a new app only once, don't even use it. It's not worthy. That's great, Renan. Wonderful. So look, look, we are getting so many new noted GPT, Corpora, Elo, Bloom's taxonomy, follow ups, integrating technology into real classroom, GPT. Wonderful, working with English varieties. Marcia, that's great. Uh, Elpidiero GPT, wonderful, wonderful idea. So yes, we are not only listening to ideas, but we are getting something. But finally, I would like to request all of you to please, please have some follow-up activities. Try to share your activities with your peers, with your students, with the experts, with your supervisors, so that they can give you some suggestions. They can uh, give you some feedback. And you can work on those feedback to ensure meaningful communication, meaningful engagement in the classroom. So thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. I'll be glad to answer your questions at the end of this session. Thank you so much. Here are my email, my Facebook profile, my LinkedIn profile. If you would like to uh, join me in any ways, thank you so much. Thank you. And sorry, I couldn't turn on my camera. Thank you. All right. Okay. Right. Thank you, Afroza. It was a great presentation, right? I guess everybody has a question after that. Okay. But now we come to Amy, right? The time is exceeded and Amy is going on. Okay, Amy, you can go. Hey, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm going to try to share my screen here. I'm not sure what but having a little bit of trouble to share my PowerPoint. So give me just a second because as you all know, um, technology never works when we want it to. So <laughs> hold on one second. Okay, we're going to take a moment. We're going to switch computers. Amy's having a little bit of trouble, and we'll get her um, set up on my side, okay? Give me one second. Thank you. All right, we're just opening up the screen share and then we'll get started here. Yeah, you should be good. And then you can just click on the screen to go through. Click on this on your screen? Yeah. Oh, okay. 
Oh, sorry, I'm just stopping the screen. <laughs> Am I in the okay? And I'm unmuted. Yes. Okay. Hey, and everybody, um, I'm on Dustin's computer. We happen to be in the office uh, together this morning. So thanks for your patience in <laughs> letting me switch this stuff around. So nice to be here with all of you. Um, my name is Amy Croce. Uh, I am an instructor here at the English Language Center. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about teaching methods in the 21st century. What um, and I think so many people have brought up so many great points. And so I'm just going to add a little bit about things that I like to work with. I am the reading coordinator here at the English Language Center. So um, when Afroza asked the question about, would you prefer to watch a movie or read a book? I was read a book all the way. <laughs> so um, I wouldn't be a good uh, reading teacher if I didn't ask you if you had received a present today. And um, for those of you who have taken my classes, you know that that means I'm going to share a poem with you. So here's a, a present for you um, today, and it's one of my favorites, and it's called This is Just to Say. This is just to say, I have eaten the plums that were in the icebox and which you were probably saving for breakfast. Forgive me, they were delicious, so sweet and so cold. I love this poem because I think it tells us something about our everyday lives, um, our interactions with other people. And um, it's one of my favorites to share with the students because they can all relate to brothers and sisters or family members who have also eaten something that they were saving, especially for, for later. And the poet here wrote this um, note to his wife for taking her plums. All right, I'm going to ask you whether you agree or disagree with a couple of these um, sentences. So tell me what you think. Agree or disagree? Students love to read. I'm guessing what a lot of you are saying. <laughs> Second, students love to read in English. I can see, see it coming through. Most of you say, nope, not a lot. It's really hard, right? This is for you. I have time to focus on reading in my class. Okay. Sometimes, nope, 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 and no. <laughs> Some of you saying yes. Many of you know because you have other things that you have to do in your classes. And then the last question um, is about resources. I have resources to focus on reading in my class. Some people say just reading skills, no extra. Some of you are disagreeing, no, no time, no resources. Some of you are able to, so that's good sometimes, yeah. So I think that the question um, that a lot of people ask, especially about reading is what can connect us across time and across space and across cultures and across technology. And for me, um, the thing that can connect us are stories, um, however we get those stories. And the stories include things like joy and identity and things that we struggle with and pain and growth. And this is what people like to um, hear about and talk about. Somebody uh, um, mentioned uh, in a question previously in the earlier seminar, you know, what do you do when you have students who look down all the time, they're at, on their phones, they, they have a hard time connecting, but students really do like to hear stories and they like to talk about stories and they like to talk about their stories and how um, those stories impact them. So um, I want to talk a little bit about how we can use literature in um, L2 learning context. Now, I know a lot of you are like, no, I can't do it. You just are saying, no, I can't do this. And there are a lot of, a lot of pr problems potentially with using literature 
Um, one is teacher discomfort. If you are not familiar with literature, you you don't read it a lot, you, you might have a harder time. Sometimes students are resistant because they see like literature and they think, oh, I can't do this. Of course, time requirements and then text difficulty is another one that can be really hard. Um, if, if the text is too hard for students, I probably won't say too easy, but most of the time too difficult. But there's lots of benefits for using literature in our classrooms. One is that it helps build cultural knowledge. It gives a source of authentic language to students. It gives a lot of input and opportunity for language acquisition. It's enjoyable. It's motivating for students. Um, I remember when students tell me, oh, Amy, I read a whole book in English for the first time, how proud they are when they actually get through a whole book. Some of them have never done that before. And it's really exciting to see them um, build their excitement and want to read more once they've gotten a little taste of it. I think that successful reading of literature also builds a lot of confidence. Um, and then one of the things that we do in our classroom is we talk about themes, right? We talk a lot about human experiences, and um, I think literature provides a lot of interesting topics um, for writing, for thinking, for more creativity. And then finally, literature promotes critical thinking skills. So one thing I'd like to use uh, in my classes is young adult literature. Um, Young adult literature became common in the late 1960s, but it has really um, exploded into popularity in the past 10 years or so. And the definition of young adult literature has expanded to include readers from ages 10 to 25, which is a pretty big age range. And some of the characteristics of young adult literature include like a young adult pro protagonist. This is why students like this, right? Because they're reading about somebody who is a similar age to them and they can connect with those kinds of characters. And you can see several other characteristics, um, including current slang, um, detailed description. Usually there's a positive resolution, not always, but usually. Um, and they're shorter than maybe regular novels. They're written with a teen voice, and typically most YA lit has some kind of journey towards identity, um, teenagers dealing with issues that they can relate to. So some examples of YA lit that maybe you are familiar with just because Netflix um, adapts a lot of YA novels. You can see a couple of there, All the Boys I've Loved Before, Dumpling, Six of Crows, you might have seen um, some of those on Netflix. And um, there's, there's such a wide variety of um, YA literature that is available that represents a lot of different um, voices, ethnicities, um, and gender identities. And I think um, this is what our students, especially um, in high school, middle school, even university are, are dealing with. So how do I use literature YA Lit with my students? One thing that I do with my students is using literature circles. Now, this is not new. Um, but I think in, in the age of technology, it's always good when we don't have a lot of resources to go back to things that we know. And sometimes we don't have the resources to do a lot of things digitally. And sometimes we want to get our students off of their phones. And I think that Y Lit and Lit Circles is a great way to do that. So Lit Circles really are small peer-led discussion groups and the students choose to read the same story. It could be a poem, could be an article, could be a book, um, whatever resources are available um, to you. Everybody in the group takes notes, they bring ideas, they follow a regular reading schedule. And um, the reason to do Lit Circles um, reading research tells us that readers become better readers by reading more, which is the problem, right? Students don't like to read, so they don't read, so they don't become better readers. And we want to really encourage them 
um, to, to read more. The reading research also tells us that readers read more when they can choose what they like to read. And then they also read more when they can read what is comprehensible to them. A lot of my students, um, I have to undo a lot of the learning that they have done is that reading has to be hard. They have to look up every word in order for it really to be beneficial to them. I have to undo a lot of that to say, no, really, you should be reading something that you can understand. So there's 11 ingredients and I know I'm running out of time. So I'm just gonna highlight a few of them and then let you guys open some questions. Um, the key ingredients um, focus on how lit circles are different from other types of cla classroom instruction. So lit circles are meant to resemble what real readers do and these ingredients should be kept in mind. The first one is that students should choose their own reading material. That is very difficult. You're, you're giving a wide open option to students and you're like, what are they gonna do with it? Sometimes we don't know what they will do with it, um, but it's, it's great to give them a choice. And I like to say, give them a guided choice. And I think you know your students really well, you know what might work for them, what might not work for them. Um, there's a whole lot of things you can use for lit circles, short stories, folk tales, poems, graded readers, newspapers, magazine articles, um, on topics that are of interest to your students. Why lit? Children's lit. I'm a big fan of children's lit novels, anything that will help them. I like to give my students a guided choice. Like I'll choose a few things that I think are good and have them choose from my choice. Um, so sometimes that's how I, how I guide them. Usually they're small temporary groups. Different groups can read different books. Maybe they all read the same book. Groups meet on a regular schedule. They use written or drawn notes. Now here's where you bring in technology. Um, you can use um, all kinds of uh, online supported technology. I know Leah mentioned Padlet, which is a great one to use for um, this kind of thing. Um, if you know anything about literature circles, there's a lot for literature 2.0, lit circles 2.0, where you have different roles for the students. Um, and I really like these. They have, you know, really updated like a tweeter, I guess you have to call them an Xer now, uh, graphic designer, lots of different, different things for students to do as they read and get involved in these discussion groups. Um, you can see uh, lots of other things related to the ingredients um, for lit circles and I'm blasting through these because we don't have enough time here, but um, I just uh, want to say that uh, there's lots of things you can do. Uh, I've had amazing students do great project work. Um, I'll, I'll link this for you, but one of, one of my student groups created a book trailer after they had read the book to advertise it to other students. They got so excited about these kinds of projects. Um, there's all kinds of different things. So. Um, I know we have a lot, a uh, lot of information that all three of us just gave you. Um, and so I want to give just a little time, even though we're at noon, to give you a little time to ask any questions that you want to any of us um, and to, to let you let you chat with us. Thank you so much for letting us share. I wish we had more time. I teach a whole class on um, using lit circles and why lit. So um, maybe sometime <laughs> we'll be able to, to share more. I'm gonna stop my share and open it up again to um, questions that, that you all have. I see there's a question about um, the yeah. of AI in literature. I just read a really interesting article in The Atlantic from a high school English teacher who said that AI and ChatGPT has kind of released him from teaching essay writing because 
ChatGPT can do that in an instant and it's hard to avoid students cheating. So instead of writing lots of essays, they're doing reading, really close reading of literature and able to spend a lot more time on critical thinking and reading, including what ChatGPT is creating, but also of classic texts and modern texts. And I thought that was a really refreshing thing that maybe I'll think about like a return to more small form intensive reading instead of so much emphasis on essay prep. What about you, Emmy? Um, yeah, I think Leah answered that perfectly. Um, I think it it gives it, it gives us more chances to help students to think critically, to um, help them develop their curiosity a little bit more. Um, yeah, I think I think those are a couple of the areas. We have a question from. How are you dealing with the trending book ban issue in the U.S.? Oh boy, um, I mean that's a huge, huge question. Uh, I think here at the university we're a little bit freer to deal with um, to deal with that that issue. Um, I don't think we have enough time to go into it. Um, the U.S. is well, so but... yeah. The U.S. is so local by local. We don't have a national, you know, education central. Yeah. So in this community, we don't have that problem yet that yes. I'm aware of. Um, so I know in in my my mother was a librarian. Um, they have that issue in their community. Uh, so it's just something that they work work through, fight about, I guess. Um, Is it more in Florida? No, it's in many other places in the U.S. Um, but but Florida is one place, certainly. Yeah, I noticed someone said children's literature is a very strong tool to teach English. I love using children's literature. I think it's fantastic. Students um, are a little bit resistant at first because they think it's children's literature. But actually, children's literature is so rich in language. It's rich in visuals. Um, and the stories are really beautiful, things that we can relate to. So, yeah. And about the experience of uh, adults having the chance to read uh, literature for children? Is uh, it sorry, I missed good? the question. I mean, you ask adults to read literature for kids. Oh, yes. I love it when they read Do you think it's literature. beautiful, it's good? I, I do. Um, I think it's really great. Uh, and most of the time, they forget. Actually, most of the time they get really so involved that I have to cut people off and say, okay, we have to go back to, to something else. So, yeah. I think uh, Leah, Victoria asked a question here um, about, uh, she said, re reflecting on when students ask how US Americans live in their culture, she talks about what she experienced. So her question is, what's the best method or approach to answer student curiosity? So they yeah. they don't just take one answer, but they develop a curiosity for that. Yeah, I think for me, I love, as you know, I love Padlet. So I'll keep a Padlet maybe on a topic that students ask me about a lot and just collect things. Like as I find good TikToks or YouTube videos or you know memes or whatever that, that represent other people's, especially young people's ideas or experiences, I'll just keep those so that when people ask me that stuff, I can share other things um, with them. But it's a big task, right? We can't know everybody's experience about everything all the time. So just being open about like, well, here's my experience, but you might know, or other people would have different experiences, it's important. Okay. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be with you and I hope everybody 
and have enjoyed it so much, okay, as I am, okay? Thank you so much, Leah. Thank you, Dustin, Emily, Amy, right? And Afroza, which was great, okay? Now we have the break, and then we will be back later, right? See you. Thank you so much, everyone. Folks, we will be back at 2 p.m. Brazil, Brazilian time with our second keynote in the promotional session. Thank you so much for being with us. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Uh...